Uh, my name is Kevin Hazard. I'm a former paramedic and writer. Um, wrote A Thousand Naked Strangers and also American Sirens, the book about Freedom House. I serve on the board of an international medical relief organization that sends um, doctors, nurses, and paramedics around the world to uh, austere environments, low resource environments um, for, uh, you know, anytime that there's uh, some sort of medical specialty needed. I was an active paramedic from 2003 to 2013. And I've been sort of uh, living on the outskirts of it ever since. You know, after after 9-11, I think like a lot of people, I was kind of looking for um, a way to be involved in something larger than myself. I wasn't sure exactly what form that would take. And I was working at a newspaper at the time and I covered a story about a tunnel collapse. And um, part of that story involved the high angle technical rescue team. When I came in contact, you know, even though they were fire department employees and, and I, that's not the direction I chose. When I saw them, when I just watched what they did and sort of the work they were involved with, I realized that that was a way that I could do this. And so I quit my job and went to school. You know, I mean, medicine is ever changing. So, you know, EMS is, um, you know, a lot of times it's sort of the caboose. It's being led around by anything else that's going on. Um, but when I first got in, it seemed as though the biggest concerns were communication. You know, everybody was, people remembered very well the lack of communication or the inability to communicate that happened between these agencies on 9-11 and everyone kind of was looking at their own services saying, wow, you know, my my radio can't talk to the police radio. So if something like that were to happen here, what would we do? And that was kind of, you know, that and, and also that was the beginning of of, of services, uh, you know, sort of amassing all of the, the larger um, equipment that that started coming along through these these federal grants. And so that was kind of where people were. And by the time I left. You know, not only had the medicine changed things like, you know, atropine and lidocaine and, you know, things like that gone um, and also, you know, much smarter delivery of oxygen. Whereas, you know, once upon a time, if someone had an MI, they were getting a non rebreather slapped on them and, and you know, people began to realize, oh, wow, this is actually more harmful than anything else. But the 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 um, priorities of the job had also shifted, you know, in that time, mass shootings became a huge thing. And suddenly now there's. You know, there are questions about what, you know, what role paramedics need to play in, in those kind of things. Um, also, you know, the sort of um, large incidents that we've seen with, you know, police and and um, in the black community in particular and EMS's role in that, you know, that has since sprung up. That was not something that anybody talked about, you know, sort of, you know, medics and, and cops by necessity have always worked hand in hand. And I think oftentimes, you know, medics allowed cops to sort of take the lead role in it. And and I people have begun to reevaluate that. And, you know, the other big thing that I, I saw was this understanding of the importance of mental health. You know, when I first started, I remember somebody saying to me, you know, after a particularly bad call, like, hey, you just need to bury that, you know, take that home with you and, and you know, deal with it in your own way. But you certainly don't talk about that. Nobody wants to hear about that. We all have our you know, we all have our bad stories. And, you know, since, since really since I left, um, the world has opened up to this idea and, and people are now talking about things and acknowledging that, you know, discussions of mental health and, and wellness are not, you know, that doesn't sort of, it's not an indicator of some sort of weakness or, or a defect. It's, it's, it's a reality. That needs to be dealt with since people are dealing with it in a constructive way and, and where when I was there, it, it certainly wasn't the case at all. So, you know, things like that are really interesting to watch. It's it, And a lot of it has to do with human behavior. And of course, you know, like I said, the medicine's constantly changing. I mean, when I started, I remember somebody saying to me, we were refilling a jug box and um, and and they, you know, I, I got a new vial of Narcan because the old one had expired. And they said, well, get used to it. You know, Narcan always expires. The the days of, of heroin overdoses are over. You're going to get very little Narcan in your life. And then, of course, by the time I left, um, you know, people were buying it at CVS because it had become such a huge thing. So, you know, EMS is, you know, in, in a funny way, it's sort of uh, the canary in the coal mine for society. Anything that's going out on the streets 
is going to happen, you know, is going to affect us and, and we will in turn affect, you know, because I mean, that's, that's the nature of the job, but more than any other brand of medicine, EMS is, um, is very intimate and one-on-one -on -one and whatever's, whatever's happening, um, we'll be the ones called out to deal with it. And so, you know, um, our version of medicine will always reflect that. And, and also, you know, we, as just ordinary people will reflect what's going on in the world. Well, somebody who'd read my first book sent me an email. I don't know who this person was. I, I no longer have the email. And they just, you know, it was just someone who said, hey, I read your book. Have you ever heard of this other thing called Freedom House? And I had not. And so I Googled it and, you know, up pops really very little information, but, you know, just enough for me to realize that something had happened um, that, you know, we, we all in EMS, we all know about the 1965 white paper. And then we, you know, there's this sort of like Johnny and Roy, you know, origin story that everybody talks about, which is, you know, the TV show Emergency comes out, and inspires a generation of people to become paramedics. So essentially what that is, is there, you know, in 65, there's an acknowledgement that there's no advanced pre-hospital medicine and that people are dying because of it. And then seven years later, you have this television show that's inspired by the idea of, of advanced pre-hospital medicine, but there's no discussion of the bridge between those two things. How, what, what happened in the intervening seven years? And people talked about things like Seattle and Miami and Los Angeles and never in, in particular depth, but, but as if those were the only places and then you start looking in a Freedom House and you realize that not only did Freedom House precede those programs, but you know, in many cases they were they were more in depth than those programs. And yet, it, you know, that part of the history is not known at all. And and a lot of the things that happen around the country, and this is, you know, something that I sort of slowly, a strand that I slowly unspooled over time, borrowed from Freedom House. They 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 sort of were inspired by or or took bits and pieces of, you know, Peter Saffer, who who designed the Freedom House curriculum, was a believer in open source medicine. And in, in, in his view, medicine should be something that everybody shares openly and freely. And and that the only way to advance ideas is by this sort of even exchange. And so he wanted his program to be emulated as by as many people as possible. Um, you know, he went on to create the NREMT, you know, he, he, he did a lot of things to try to make this um, a community and realizing that and realizing what a pivotal role that Freedom House played over this short period of time and how unknown they were. And, and then you realize that, oh, wait, you know, this book that everybody points to and that, you know, people are constantly trying to search down copies of called Emergency Care in the Streets was written by the Freedom House medical director um, based on her experiences with, with running calls with Freedom House and the things that she learned from them and, and, and also the things that they learned from her. And, and people look at that, you know, people who've never heard of Freedom House know Nancy Caroline. They know emergency care in the streets. So you just, I, I realized very quickly that there was something huge that had happened here um, and that, no, that nobody knew about. And having been a paramedic, having worked for 10 years in the field, um, a, a decade that was, you know, transformative period of my life, you know, I kind of took it personally that this this bit of history had been overlooked and that this is really sort of where it all began. And yet somehow we didn't we didn't know anything about it. And then, of course, once you start digging into it, you realize that this is a story that's populated at every turn um, by fascinating people. And so it just, you know, it just became one of those all consuming stories that, that the more I dug into it, the sort of deeper I got. There's so many, um, you know, some of it was uh, realizing, um, you know, how interconnected everything is and how, how, how little things change. You know, I wrote this book during 2020. So we were in the midst of COVID. We were in the midst of, of George Floyd. And so those those things were casting very large shadows over contemporary America. And here I was, you know, researching something from... 40 years earlier, that was just as mired in questions of race and, and skepticism over medicine, you know, as, 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 as they were today. So that was kind of a fascinating thing. You know, Peter Saffer's story was really kind of, that was one of the first things I stumbled on that I just remember being shocked by, um, you know, the, the CPR studies, the way that he 
you know, created CPR and the sort of very seat of your pants nature in which he he did these studies and just the bold way that he did it. And the fact that he was able to convince people to be sedated and paralyzed for hours at a time while he kept them alive with, with lay people um, who had been given a 20 second crash course in this brand new unproven method called rescue breathing. Um, you, to me, it was, it was one of the most audacious, one of the most shocking, one of the most thrilling, um, exciting things that I'd ever seen. I was just, I was blown away by that. Um, and in addition, you know, I was, I was blown away by the, the people that, that, that became the Freedom House medics, not only the way in which they entered the field, which, you know, in hindsight, I guess it makes perfect sense. But, you know, these were guys who were putting their lives on hold to take a training course for a job that technically did not exist. This is a huge leap of faith that they were making. And, you know, similar to the people who agreed to Saffir's study, you know, people who were agreeing to become his students and, and take this course and, you know, eventually take the reins of this job, you, you have to wonder, well, what was going on in their lives that they were willing to set everything aside to do this, on, on, to take this gamble? And what you realize is that, you know, they were in, in almost every single case, they were people who had been told you don't count by society. And they simply never believed that. And in and, and of all places, in the back of an ambulance, um, they found a way to show the world exactly what they were worth. And, and they did it in dramatic and wildly successful fashion and forever changed the way lives are saved around the world. So you can't you can't get into this story and meet these people and learn what it was they did, how they did it, why they did it, where and when they did it without just being in complete awe of, 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 of them and what they were able to accomplish. Yeah, Freedom House, they have a very interesting legacy. I mean, on the one hand, part of their legacy is that, you know, they were uh, taken down, swept under the rug and forgotten by racism. And that, that you know, the fact that they were black men ultimately becomes the the Achilles heel that brings down the organization. So that on the one hand, that's part of their legacy. Um, part of their legacy are these technical things that they did, you know, being the first ones to give Narcan to reverse an overdose and, you know, developing and field testing the nation's first standardized paramedic training curriculum, um, you know, helping to pioneer the design of the modern ambulance, um, the use of a medical director, to help run a program, you know, as you just mentioned, um, intubation in the field, all these things that they did, all these medical things that they did, but, you know, above all, all else, both, you know, issues of society, issues of race, issues of, issues of medicine, what, what stands out to me when I, when I talk about Freedom House, when I think about Freedom House, is the character of the people involved. You know, they did an, an incredibly difficult job and they did it under almost impossible odds. And yet they did it with, an unbelievable amount of grace and dignity and never allowed what was going on around them to affect the care that they delivered to patients. That's, you know, as a medical provider, that's a thing you strive for, but very few of us have ever been forced or asked to do it under those sort of conditions. And yet they did, and they did it. They performed their jobs flawlessly for, for nearly a decade. Um, and then they went on and they took whatever lessons they learned from that time and they carried it out into the wider world into other parts of, of society into other fields and, and, and to whatever they did for the rest of their lives. And, you know, those, th th those guys and the work they did is really, I mean, it's a, it's a genuinely, genuinely inspiring story. Um, and they are, you know, just to have a conversation with them. It's, it's a really humbling um, and eye-opening experience. So, you know, to me, that's the thing that stands out. That's the thing that, that is their ultimate legacy is this, this you know incredible um, legacy of 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 grace and service that that they provided the rest of us um, that you know for far too long they were never even acknowledged for. Yeah, I'm currently working on a book. Uh, it takes place during the 2014 Ebola outbreak. Um, it's about the uh, doctors, aviators, and engineers who created the system that allows uh, that that allows um, 
for the transport of, of people infected with highly infectious diseases um, around the world. So that was how they got uh, and continue to get, you know, doctors um, into and out of places uh, around the world where there are outbreaks um, when, when they get sick. So it's uh, it's an incredible story of not only <clears throat> the outbreak itself, but also just these people who, who sort of pulled off the impossible um, in order to, uh, you know, to save the lives of, of physicians, but then also, you know, ordinary people who are, who are around the world and, and find themselves sick. It's really a, an incredible story. So that's what I'm working on there.